Amen. Listen, we're going to read out of 1 Samuel chapter 24 this morning. And uh, I hope you don't mind reading a large passage of scripture because to be honest with you, I think I'm going to go ahead and read the whole chapter. One of my sisters encouraged me the other day and said, hey, if you ever want to just read like you used to, I'll come and sit there with the tea and read. So I'm like, praise God. Because, you know, preachers are like, we used to, when we were in school, they're like, man, you shouldn't really read all that much of the Bible because people are going to lose interest. But Paul told Timothy, pay attention to your doctor. Pay attention to public reading of scripture. So maybe we should listen to the Apostle Paul instead of some of the seminaries out there. Right? I know some of you are like, you mean cemeteries? All right. So we're in 1 Samuel chapter 24. We're just going to go ahead and read the whole chapter. and, and then, uh, but, let, but before we read the chapter, let me just give you a little bit of background. I want you to know that by this time, David has already been anointed to be king. Okay. David has already killed Goliath. Amen. And, uh, and so he's, he is the chosen of God, but yet he's not, he has not been able to walk into the destiny that God has called for him. All right, so here we go. It came to pass when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, what that means is that he was chasing after them for battle, that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheep coats, by the way, where was a cave. And Saul went in to cover his feet, and David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee. I want you to pay a close attention to this verse, chapter Verse because look at this. I mean, it says, and the men of David said unto him, behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him. Because he had cut off Saul's skirt. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David stayed his servants, or told them to stop with these words, and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. David also arose afterward and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, My Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed himself. And David said to Saul, Wherefore hearest thou men's words? In other words, why are you listening to the words of your men that say, Behold, David seeks your hurt. Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord had delivered you today into my hand in the cave. And some bade me or told me to kill you, but my eyes spared you. And I said, I will not put forth my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, see, you see the skirt. By the way, Saul was his father-in-law at this point. He had married one of his daughters. Moreover, my father, see you see the skirt of thy robe in my hand, for in that I cut off the skirt of thy robe and killed thee not. Know thou, see that there is neither evil nor transgression in my hand, and I have not sinned against you. Yet there, yet you hunt my soul to take it. The Lord judge between me and you, and the Lord avenge me of thee, but my hand shall not be upon thee. As says the proverb of the ancients, wickedness proceeds from the wicked, but my hand shall not be upon thee. After whom is the king of Israel come out? After whom do you pursue? After a dead dog? After a flea? The Lord therefore be judge and judge between me and you and see and plead my cause and deliver me out of your hand. And it came to pass when David made an end of speaking these words to Saul that Saul said, is this your voice, my son David? 
And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. And he said to David, you are more righteous than I, for you have rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded you evil. And you have showed this day how that you have dwelled well with me. For as much as when the Lord had delivered me into your hand, you killed me not. For if a man find his enemy, will he let him go well away? Wherefore the Lord reward thee good, for thou hast done unto me this day. You know, I, I don't really, I, I, this wasn't in my notes, but I just want to say, look at verse 19. It says, if a man find his enemy, will he let him go well away? Wherefore the Lord reward you good for that you have done. You know, the ways of the world, what the world has its own way of handling business. And what I'm trying to say is, is that when someone does you wrong, then you turn around and you do them wrong. And that's what the scripture, what, what, what David, what Saul has come to the realization that David had the opportunity. See, Saul was doing him wrong and, and Saul realizes that he, that David had the opportunity to do him wrong, but that instead he didn't do that. And I got to tell you that true Christianity looks like that. I got to tell you that when the Holy Spirit does not work on the inside of someone's heart and that whenever some, you realize someone has done wrong to you, that the right thing to do is to forgive them. The right thing to do is to allow the Holy Spirit to have his way in your heart, even though you think you have a right to be vengeful, even though you think in your own mind that you're justified to get your own justice, I'm here to tell you that Jesus didn't require that of you. Jesus laid his life down so that he could be good to you and he wants you and I to in turn allow his work to be done in our heart that we would be a reflection of his goodness in his life. Amen. Amen. Thank you Lord. What verse were we in? Verse 20. Verse 20. And now behold I know well that thou shalt surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in thy hand. You know what's crazy is, is that Saul's saying this because look, I got to, I want to get ahead of myself, but Saul's a type of the flesh. And I got to tell you something, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I got it already in my notes, but I want you to know there's an ongoing saga between the flesh and the spirit. Ongoing saga. In every life of every believer, your flesh is going to try to get you to bypass the spirit, to do what, to do what it is that you want to do. Because two chapters later, the same exact thing happens. The Lord puts the Lord puts Saul in David's hands. He goes and he grabs the spear and the, and the cruise of water and he brings it back to his camp and he does the same thing because Saul, Saul's saying, surely you're called to be king. Now we can see the will of God. But yet two chapters later, Saul's chasing him again. The, 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 flesh is, is, the flesh keeps trying to rise up, keeps trying to go against the will of God. Yeah. And, 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 and again, David's men, again, trying to tell him, look what the Lord did. He put your, put your enemy in your hand. And listen, he said, let me go ahead and stab him with this spear. I won't have to do it twice. <laughs> and, and David said, no, this is the Lord's anointing. See, David, the spirit, already knew in your spirit that, listen, You've been saved in your spirit. You've been made one with the Lord in your spirit. And the scripture says in 1 John 2, 20, you have an unction or an anointing from the Holy One and you know all truth. The Holy Spirit is designed to speak to your spirit, but your mind and your soul and your own will and your own emotions get in the way and try to push the voice of God out and your flesh in its bitterness and in its unthankfulness and in its unforgiveness tries to get in the way of what the Spirit's designed to do and we battle against the God, God's will in our own heart and life and the Lord wants us to get to the place where we'll believe that and so Saul says oh, surely you're going to be king but then two chapters later he's doing the same thing and trying to chase down the young king swear now therefore unto me by the Lord that you will not cut off my seed after me and that you will not destroy my name out of my father's house I got to tell you None of, these, none of this stuff is in my notes, but this is so good. So Saul's saying, I, I need you to give me a promise, David. I realize now you're going to be king. Promise me you won't cut off my seed after me. And David ends up telling him, okay, king, I promise you. Now, it was kind of easy for David because, too, he had, made a, he had made a soul tie. He had made a connection with Saul's son, Jonathan, which is a whole other story. I wish we had time to really preach this morning because that's beautiful. Okay, but anyway, David does not forget Saul's seed. You know, that's not how kings back then acted. As a matter of fact, have you ever read the book of First and Second Kings? Have you seen, or even the book of Judges? Have you seen what they did? 
Whenever they became leader, they went back and killed all their own brothers. They'd go back and kill all their own brothers because they didn't want anybody else to have a chance to take the throne from them. And, and what, what the scripture is saying is, is that one day David wakes up, and I'm just going to let you know, after he's king. And he goes and he talks to his servant. He says, is there anyone of the house of Saul that remains that I can bless? <laughs> And anyway, that's the whole story of Mephibosheth. But what I'm trying to tell you is, is that David is a type of the Holy Spirit moving, is that the Spirit does things that are completely contrary to the flesh because the Spirit and the flesh are at war with one another. And most of the time, one of the ways that you'll know whether it's the Spirit or the flesh is that it's the complete opposite of what your flesh would want to do, right? Oh, she did me dirty. I'm going to do this. Or he did me dirty. I'm going to do that. Or the boss you know, did this, or the person at work did that, I'm going to do this. And, and, and that's what your flesh wants to do. It wants to lash out with the Holy Spirit saying something completely different. He's saying, trust me, die to yourself. And when we do that, the Holy Spirit moves in and he starts to do a work. That's whenever miracles really start to happen yes, when yes. we trust God. Amen. In that yes. way. He says, swear now that you won't cut him off. And then the last verse, verse 22, David swore unto Saul, and Saul went home, but David and his men got them up unto the hold. And I titled my message, I bow to you, your will, my king. And there were two main verses of scripture that I really wanted to kind of hone in on. And it was verse 6 and also verse 8. And verse 6 says, and then we just start with verse 6. It says, and he said unto his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed to stretch forth my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. And so I want you to know up front, so that I don't lose anyone, that I'm going to be preaching this in a, I guess you could say, in an illustrative fashion, the life of Saul, the life of David, the flesh versus the spirit, the first birth versus the second birth, birth in Adam, birth in Christ, new birth, being born again, that kind of idea there. Because, see, God has placed certain things in order. And Saul was the first, and but David was the chosen. Yes, yes. See, as a matter of fact, if you go back to whenever Saul became king, this was actually the will of the people. Yes, because, right. see, the people said, we want a king. We want to be like all the other nations. And so oftentimes in our own lives, we could be like, even I didn't know exactly what Yvette was going to say, but we could be like, no, I want to be like other people that have a right. I want to show your excellence in my life, Lord. I want to give you glory, and I'm going to get these degrees, and I'm going to do this work. And it's not that the Lord gave her the grace that she needed to get it accomplished. But seasons change, and it doesn't mean that she'll never even go back to work. The point, though, is this, is that sometimes we get caught up in the world system so much that it's like, I want the house that the Joneses have. Come on. I want the cars that the Joneses have. I want the American dream. I want this. I want that. And you know what? God's a blessing God. I've seen him bless me. But when his blessings start to supersede his will for my life, now we have a problem. And that's part of dying to self. And in our first birth in Adam, which is a type of soul, that, that's, what, that's what happens. The flesh wants what it wants. <coughs> And, what, and in our second birth in David, there comes this place where we're led by the Spirit and we're yielding to the will of God. Saul's the old man. David's the new man in Christ. This is important. I want you to know man has a plan and God has a plan. I said, man, you and me have a plan, but God has a plan for your life. And will you yield to the will of God and what he's speaking to you, or will we turn the the volume down and say, I don't want to hear that right now, and instead I want to do what I want to do. See, once we receive Christ as our Savior, there's a whole lot of old thinking, old desires, old ways that we have not wanted to let go of. And there's an ongoing rivalry between the flesh and the spirit, right? The saga uh, continues in the life of the believer. These two kings that, you know, I want you to understand and be aware that Satan will fight harder. This is very important. Satan will fight harder than anything to prevent you and I from making the journey from Saul to David. 
first of all, the Lord does not want you to, I mean, I'm sorry, this enemy does not want you to get saved. But on all, at all costs, he does not want your soul to be saved. He wants you to die without Christ and, and, and to die and, and, and to experience torment. But then once you do get saved, once you've heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and you receive it, him as your Lord and Savior, then what he wants to do is he wants to make you inactive. He wants to, he wants to make you continue to walk in the flesh. He wants you to continue to live your own life for your own purposes and your own desires. He, he doesn't want you to come to the place where you're willing to allow your flesh to be crucified. He wants, he wants you to say, no, I want to do it my way like Saul. So look, I want you to know he's going to fight it so hard to prevent you from making the journey from Saul to David. See, as long as Saul remains king in your life, the enemy of God is champion over you. I'm going back to that story of David and Goliath. As long as Saul remains king, the enemy remains champion. The things that God has prepared, prepared for you will not come to pass in your life because you will be filled with doubt and unbelief. The enemy of your soul will ridicule and antagonize you. Furthermore, there will be people within the very church that will help the enemy make you second guess the purposes that God has for your life. All this is contained in the battlefield story of David and Goliath. I mean, I didn't put it in my notes. I'm going to mention a little bit of it in a second. But because they themselves are operating under a spirit of Saul, there's people in the church. And I'm not saying that they don't love you, but a lot of times people in church don't even realize when they operate under the spirit of Saul. They don't even realize when they're operating in their flesh instead of the spirit. But let me tell you how you know. You, you care more about yourself than you do your brothers or your sisters. I'm not fussing at you. That's not you. Don't get upset with me. I'm just trying to say that you can't tell me that you've never been through that because I know myself that I've been through that. And I'm not the only one here that's ever had that problem. Because we have a selfishness in us. Yes. Because that we receive from Adam. It's in our flesh. But the word of God says to prefer your brother over yourself. The word of God. It's let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. He lowered himself. John the Baptist said, I must decrease so that he might increase. Amen. And at some point in time, the truth of God's word is supposed to affect our outward lives. Yes, yes. Amen. Yes. So Saul is resistant to God's will because, look, if God has his way, Saul doesn't get his way. And if God has his way, Saul doesn't get the glory. Saul represents the old man. And he, then the first man refuses to die. Let me tell you, <coughs> if we go into the battlefield story, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But I want you to know, I want you to remember, Goliath for 40 days stood up and he ridiculed them and he mocked them. And I've said this many times before, but they would get every day the army of Israel would get dressed and they would get in formation as though they were going to go to war. There wasn't nobody going to war. The first time I read that, and I know many of you have heard me say this so many times, the Holy Spirit, many, many years ago, when I read it after the Lord, it kind of really got an all over my heart and my head. And he said, look at this. This is my church. They get dressed up for Sunday and they go to they go through the motions, but there's nobody really living for me through the. No, I'm not saying nobody is, but you get the point. This is what he was saying to me. He was reminding me of my own life. How about if we use Pastor Matt? But but nobody's living for the Lord, living for me Monday through Saturday. Nobody's taking the victory that I've given to them. Nobody's walking in the victory that I've given to them, and they're just. They're playing church and they're they're just all dressed up and they're acting like but, but the enemy is lording over them and he's putting fear in them and everything that they see and everything that they hear is striking fear in their heart, is destroying their faith. And in reality, even though they're, they're and it says they, they would get dressed and they would get back and they would shout the war cry. It's, it was all it was all like a little, it was like a play. Like cause because 40 days he did this to them. And then and then you let the young little strapper come up in the camp and he's like, oh man, he's excited. Look, get daddy let me leave the sheep coat and I got to come over here and bring him some wine and cheese. And he's like, what in the world is this? Mom. What is going on here? Y'all are letting this uncircumcised Philistine talk me all this way. 
And then what I wanted to say is brother against brother. People in the church that you thought you wouldn't have. His own brother, Eliab, says, what are you doing, you prideful? I mean, I'm just kind of using my own words. You prideful little child. Go back to those sheep. See, the flesh under the spirit of Saul don't want nothing to be shaken up. They're going to act like this is an okay life. They're going to act like this is an okay Christianity. I'm here to tell you that it's not okay. It's not okay for you and I to sit on the battlefield of life and we're paralyzed and, we're, and, we're, and we can't move because of fear of the enemy and because the enemy has power over our life. And the whole time, the reason why is because Saul's the flesh and we're listening to him instead of listening to to the Spirit of God. Thank God for some people that will get up and say something and start provoking us. And sometimes when somebody says something you don't like it, they might not have handled it or said it the right way, but you know what you ought to do is you ought to take it to the Lord. And you ought to say, you know what, Lord, maybe whatever was said, maybe there was some truth to it. Maybe there's some people in your life that will kind of rile you up and provoke you to get you moving in the right way. And instead of feeling frustrated in the flesh over it, take it to the Lord. Because sometimes whatever people say, there's some truth to it. But we want to get offended. Amen. Amen. Amen? And so, yeah, David's brother's like, you, you arrogant, insolent little child. I mean, I don't have, I don't, I love that story, but that's not what I'm supposed to preach about. I just love that story so much to just think about the faith and the victory and the courage that that young boy had that day. Amen. Yeah. And God showed up for him. Praise God. So the story is filled with a battle between good and evil, between flesh and spirit, and even between brother and brother. And Satan wants to paralyze God's people in fear. Because the flesh wants the glory. See, Saul wants the glory. He even tried to put his own armor on David. And you know, you may not agree with this. I mean, I look at it like trying to fight. Why, like in other words, you're trying to put your armor on me. Well, boss man, why didn't you put your own armor on and get out there in that valley of evil? I think you business. Why for 40 days? Like, how, it didn't work for you. How do you think it's going to work for me? But there's a part to me that wonders, and I can't prove this. This is my opinion. There's a part to me that wonders if I put this armor on and this little boy actually pulls us off, they might think it's me out there doing it. You know, I don't know. That's, that's a complete opinion, but it wouldn't surprise me because man wants his own glory for himself. Saul wants glory, and the flesh wants glory. It doesn't want to allow God to have his glory. Amen. And we got to move out of the way. Praise God. So the Spirit says it's enough. You know, I want to just share with you, too, that Romans chapter 8, verse 5 says that they that are after the flesh mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. If you, if you are been made one with God in your spirit, the spirit speaking to you to trust and to believe and to have faith and that you instead don't believe God, don't trust God according to his word and instead walk in the flesh, then you're frustrating the grace of God, especially whenever we try to live some kind of works based Christianity and we think that the things that we're doing is what's going to give us the victory when in reality Jesus has already done it. He's already gone before us. Amen. It was, it was actually the Lord that slayed that giant on that day, by the way, because David told him, you come at me with spirit and sword, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. Amen. And he said, we're going to feed you to the birds today, man. Hey, praise God. And he did. He did. He did. He did. Yes, Amen. Man. He fed it to the birds. So this, I know, you know, even after the fact that God's anointing of David is proven true. David kills a giant. Saul couldn't kill it. And there's this still this ongoing saga is what I'm trying to say. The flesh Saul versus David. David's been anointed by the prophet to be king. Everybody in town knows it now. You can tell in the story that Saul knew it, right? Saul said, he said, surely now I know you're going to be king. Everybody knows that David's supposed to be king, but the flesh refuses to let the spirit take the throne. What does this even mean in your life? I don't know what's, what it means in your life, but it means something. <laughs> There's something that you've been contending with God about. There's something that the Lord has been speaking to you about. And whatever it is, and you, and, and you or you or me, and we refuse 
to allow that part of our life and our heart to die. Instead, we think it's everything else that's going on around us and it's everybody else's fault and, and it's all of them. No, it's not. It's not them. Yeah, I'm not, okay, let me not get ahead of myself, but look, it's not them. It's us. Yes, yes. The Lord's dealing with you as an individual, and he's dealing with me as an individual, and he wants us to come to the place of submission. Submission to his will. Amen? God's hands in all of this because God has a perfect plan, and he has perfect timing, and he tests the hearts of his saints. I want you to know that. God has a perfect plan for your life, and, 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 but, he's, but he does put us to the test. He puts our faith to the test. The trying of your faith being much more precious than gold. That's what the tests in life are about. To test our faith about endurance. Will we endure when we go through these things? Or will we get frustrated and quit? See, 2 Timothy says this. It says, endure hardness. The King James, that's what the King James says. Another translation says, endure the hardships as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, no man that wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. I think about, I think about the fact that Saul tried to put that armor on him. And I think about it, David, because I know that David wasn't as big as Saul, because it says Saul was like actually shoulders above the rest of the camp. His brother might have ran a close, Eli might have ran a close race, but not David, not young David. And if they would have put that armor on him, I just said he'd have got it all entangled in all of that mess. And, and, and so many times in our own Christian walk, he said, don't get yourself entangled in civilian affairs. It doesn't mean that you don't live a, that you don't have to live partly as a civilian on the earth. That we have to go to work, right? We have to we have to pay our bills, amen. We have we have all of these things. But the point is, is that we can get entangled in this. Yes. <laughs> to the point where to, to the point where it grips us and it prevents us from moving into the, to the will of God for our lives. So that was the first thing, is that really what I was trying to tell you is that the Lord, is that David said, I'm not going to touch the anointed. And what I was trying to say is, is that God's anointing has a plan. And what I want you to know is, is that, that while Saul was the first, he wasn't the chosen. And that God has a perfect plan for your life and that his anointing on your life, if we will yield to that, he will lead us and guide us. And look, I go back to that scripture where I quoted earlier, 1 John 2.20, it says this, you have an unction, but in the, another English word is anointing. You have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all truth. The Holy Spirit on the inside of you desires to speak his truth to you. But many times our our mind and our own will get in the way, and that and that ends up resulting in actions of our flesh that we don't yield to the will to the will of God. So that was number that was the first verse I wanted you to see about the anointing. But look at verse eight, <coughs> First Samuel twenty four verse eight. It says, and David also arose afterward and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, My Lord the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed himself. And, and I just couldn't help but to see that the main point I wanted to tell you is that David humbled himself and reverenced God's will. <laughs> now he's bowing to the king. But again, I want you to try to imagine what you, what you might have felt like had the Lord anointed you to be king. I mean, if you don't remember the story, Samuel had, the people cried out for Saul. The Lord told Samuel to go anoint Saul to be king. Saul rejects God's will and God's done with it. And so he, the Lord rolls up, on, rolls up on Samuel one day and he says, why? Basically, why are you wallowing in your self-pity? Rise up, fill your horn with oil, and I'm going to have you anoint one of Jesse's sons. And so at this time frame and juncture of the story, 
David's already been anointed. It was a big old deal, man. The prophet came to the little town of Bethlehem. Now, how the wall ran down David's head and down onto his face, and everybody knew. And Eliab, his brother, was right there, and that's probably the reason he was so frustrated on the battlefield. And he's like, why don't you just go back with them sheep? Because, see, half the time we don't even want our brothers and sisters to get the promotion. We, or we can't even be happy for them. Instead, we're frustrated because they got something we didn't get. Or we hear that the Lord blessed them. Come on. You ain't ever been there before. I can tell you how I have. You know, man, the Lord blessed me. I got this great opportunity for this new house. Or look at this vehicle. God, how God blessed me. It's like, huh. You know, like y'all just all tore up on the inside, just all frustrated and irritated. Why they got that kind of deal? Why I couldn't get that kind of deal? Man, no, you probably won't get a deal like that. <laughs> because you're over here walking around and you're irritated and frustrated with your brother and your sister. I'm just trying to make it real for you. Real time in the, in the, in the real world that we live in. And that's what Ilya, he was just all upset. But anyway. I wanted you to see that God has a will, amen, and that David humbled himself, and he reverenced God's will. Yes, he bowed down. He bowed down to the king, to King Saul, is what it says. It says that he bowed down himself unto the king, And but what, but what he's really doing, I want you to understand, is he's bowing himself to God's will. Yeah. Because, see, the timing wasn't right. Yet. That's right. But I just imagine myself being young David and thinking, man, here I was. I wasn't asking for this. The hot oil poured down my head that day. Everybody, I done killed the giant. Lord, you were with me. <laughs> you were with me. I killed a lion. I killed a bear. I killed this giant. Lord, your anointing is with me. It's obvious that I'm the called one. And here I am running for my life, hiding in these caves. Hiding in the wilderness of been getting. And the question is, how many times in our own lives, white like, man, I gave my heart to the Lord and this is how you repay me? Right? I serve, I serve you, Lord, and this is how you repay me. I was listening to a preacher the other day, and he was talking about how, like, what some dude that knew Nikki Cruz that he thought his wife was cheating on me. He said, I took my Bible and I slung it out the window as I was driving down the road. And I thought to myself, I've been a pastor of a church, and I've done this for you, and this is how you're going to treat me? Man, I'm telling you right now, the devil's just looking for a chance to hook you up, to jack you up, and to mess you up, to get your heart bitter and hard and twisted against the Lord. And come to find out the dude's wife didn't even cheat on him. <laughs> Lord help us. But even had she had she done that. You know, the Lord has a will for our lives. Yes. And so many times we're unwilling to die to ourselves. So so David's bowing down to God's will because it's not God's timing yet, right? People struggle with this kind of stuff. We get frustrated where we are in life. We get frustrated with the job situation, right? And we don't endure. We get frustrated with the marriage and we don't endure. We get frustrated with the church and we don't endure. And if we're not careful, the next thing you know, we'll have been married four times. We'll have 12 different jobs over the last three years and we'll switch churches so many times that we finally just decide that, you know what, it ain't even worth it. I'm just going to do Jesus at home. And all I'm trying to get at is this, is that, you know, the whole time, really, it wasn't the job that was the problem. Yes. It wasn't the wife that was the problem. Amen. It wasn't the church that was the problem. I mean, hold on a second. I didn't say that there were no problems with the wife. <laughs> I didn't say there were no problems with the job. I didn't say that there were no problems with the church. But what I'm saying is that wasn't the problem, though. Yeah. You were the problem. I was the problem. And the Lord was really wanting to deal with the problem. And, and instead of us yielding to him and letting our flesh be crucified, yeah. I'm like, man, this yeah. preacher preaches too hard. No, he don't preach hard oh. enough. Because I'm trying to tell you that if we learn to yield and let the will of God happen to our heart and our life and let our flesh be crucified yeah. in Christ and let the Holy Spirit have his way, Hallelujah. And all the conflict and all the frustration and all the irritation. I just bowed down to God's will. I bowed down to you. Okay? Because it's God's will. Amen. It's bowing to God's will. You're not bowing to a man. You're not bowing to You're bowing to God's will. Amen. God's will is the best place that we could ever be. Yeah. 
Yeah. You may not understand it. You're like, how can I do that? You can't. <laughs> That's the whole trick. You can't do it. You got to cry out to the Lord. Yeah. And you got to be willing to let him do it in you. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Yes, Lord. So that's what he wants, to crucify our flesh. He wants us to die to self. If that Saul dies, David, God's will can assume the throne. Isn't that good? I mean, that's good right there. Look, if Saul dies, David can assume the throne. And at some point in time, actually it's in the second chapter, whenever they find the spear and all of that, the Lord ends up, I'm sorry, David ends up saying, the Lord's going to take care of this. He said he'll either die or maybe he'll perish in battle. I don't really know how it's going to happen, but I know God's got a call on my life. I know I was anointed to walk in the will of God. And somehow, some way, the Lord is going to do this. And I yes. want you to know that once, Saul, once you're Saul, whatever that thing is you're struggling with, whatever that thing is, you because guess what? Saul, it's an ongoing saga. Did you get that point? Because as soon as you find out that there was this one piece of flesh that was standing between you and God, then the next thing you know, you allow that thing to be crucified. You're going to find out, oh, Lord, it was something else. You might have thought it was smoking weed. You might have thought it was drinking alcohol. You might have thought it was some lust spirit that you was dealing with. And as soon as the Lord set you free from that, then it's like, oh, Lord, I don't even want to look at that mirror right there. I did not realize I had so much pride in my life. I did not realize I was so so pompous. I did not realize that I was so unteachable. I did not realize I was so critical. I did not realize I was such a mess, right? And then the Lord will start breaking it down. And then it's like, but you know what, Lord? Thank you for showing me. And I want to be like you. I want David. I want you, Lord, to rule on my heart. Lord, let's move Saul out the way. He's, a, he's just a mean king. He's not getting nothing done according to your will, Lord. I want David on my heart. And if you'll do that, man, I'm telling you right now, you're going to see the Lord moving in your life. He's going to minister to you. He's going to strengthen you. He's going to encourage you. Amen? So that's what David did. He bowed down to God's will. And, 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 and it actually, it says in the first, I put it in my notes, 1 Samuel 26, 10. So two chapters later, David said, furthermore, he's telling these men, furthermore, as the Lord lives, the Lord shall smite him. Or his day shall come to die, or she, he shall descend into battle and perish. Now, I want you to know something. I'm about to get into those two verses of Scripture a little bit deeper, and then I'm going to let you go home and eat, okay? But, but what I want you to see here is this. See, now, now he's being led by the Holy Spirit. Now he's being led by the Spirit of God when he says this. See, because it's God's will. It's God's timing. And he says, I yield to the will of God. And when God's ready... God's going to make it happen. Yes. However it's going to happen, God's going to make That's it right. happen. Amen? And so I'm getting ready to give you my, my conclusion. And, and, and I'm going to go ahead and, and, and close it out with those two verses. But, but look what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 4. Because I'm building up to verse 6. It says, the men of David said unto him. I'm going to do it again. Because I want you to see what's really going on here. All right? You ready? The men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thy hand, and thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and he cut the skirt. Why did I talk like that? Why do you think I talk like that? Because this is supposedly a prophetic word going forth right here. Is this not what this is? You tell me. This is the day that the Lord has said unto thee. And, and now they're speaking for the Lord. Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand. The, they, they're, they're, they're utilizing this as a prophetic word. They roll, up on, they roll up on the scene. They see the situation situated just right. And in their flesh, this is not a prophetic word from the Holy Spirit. This is a word that they are saying is a word of prophecy. And they're speaking it over David's life. And David starts to take action based on the word that they gave him. And he just cuts the skirt off. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit smites his heart. Now the Spirit's talking. 
Before the spirit wasn't talking, that was flesh. That was like, oh, look at the logical answer to the situation. God just set all this up for you. No, this is not God's will. And this is not God's word speaking. This is man speaking. And listen, some people might be like, well, I don't even really know if I know what a word of prophecy is. Okay, well, let's be fair. First Corinthians chapter 12, we're not going to break it down. But look, the gifts of the spirit. The Spirit speaks through prophecy. I believe that. The Spirit gives words of knowledge. He gives words of wisdom. But we don't have time to break that down right now. And I believe in that. And, I want, and, and, and listen, I've received words of knowledge. And, and I've given words of knowledge. And I want the gifts of the Spirit to flow. And I want the Holy Spirit to be restrained. But, but maybe you don't understand that a whole lot right now. And if you do, praise God. But if you don't, look. What about advice from other people? <laughs> Let's make it more practical. Every time you find yourself in a situation, have you ever noticed how people have, have opinions and advice for you? Have you ever noticed that? Am I the only one? <laughs> people have opinions and advice for you. I even remember, listen, y'all probably still tired of my stories. I remember my old pastor, you say, man, y'all gonna fire me after a while because I don't even get to use these old stories. But it's a good story that I went to two spirit-filled men, one was a pastor, because I was offered a job for $10,000 more a year. Now, one of the men was a, was a person that operated in prophetic gifts. But both of these men that I respected highly told me, well, it's pretty much a no-brainer. I mean, it's $10,000 more a year. You know, and all this kind of stuff. I think you should take it. Long story short, y'all heard the story. I took the, took the job. I gave a 60-day notice at Bayou Pediatrics. Dude, I had no peace. Every time I turned around, my peace was robbed. My joy was robbed. One thing after the other happened. Nothing was going the way that it was supposed to. And the whole time, the whole, you know what the Holy Spirit wants you to know? The Holy Spirit wants you to know that if you're saved this morning, His Spirit lives on the inside of your spirit. He wants to speak to you. Amen. And it's not that He'll never give you a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom. As a matter of fact, He might give you a bunch of them. But if it's not lining up with what the Spirit of God is saying, or if the advice that you're receiving from other people is not lining up with the word of God. That's what we got to understand too. That's why the written word of God is so important. You can't get enough of the word of God in you because it's going to teach you God's character. The whole thing, parts of it, and the more you work with it, the more it's going to renew your mind to think according to kingdom business, according to the Lord's way of thinking instead of your own. It goes from, it goes from just knowledge to wisdom and from wisdom to understanding. You begin to actually take on the word. God says you have the mind of Christ. But most of the time, the reason our mind needs to be renewed is because our mind's not renewed. We're not thinking the way God's word tells us to think. So we have to learn the word of God so that we'll think the way God's word is teaching us to think. And if somebody gives you advice and you're saved and the Holy Spirit lives in you and you feel like, dude, that is not God's will. You know what I'm talking about? Have you ever been in a conversation with somebody who... Listen, and I'm not saying that they don't love God. But look, if they walk in the flesh, they're going to say something. And when they say it, you're going to know. Your spiritual antenna is going to come up. And you're going to be like, that's not God. Right? And, and David knew when he went to go act upon the word that they had given him. He knew this is not God's will. So that was, that was the, 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 uh, the first thing that I wanted you to see. Because David responded is not God's will. Amen, that this thing be done. So the second thing I wanted you to see was in that verse, uh, in that verse eight, where David bowed down. Remember that he bowed down to God's will is what I said. And while I was praying about the message, see, originally I thought I was going to talk about end times. I thought I was going to talk about the things going on in Jerusalem. I thought I was going to talk about the Temple Mount, the, the red heifers and all this stuff. But I, I never really had a release. And as I was praying, I felt like the Lord spoke to me and said, a broken and a contract spirit I will not despise. And see, the psalmist David wrote that psalm, Psalm chapter 51, verse 7. It says, this is what the scripture says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, yes. you will not despise. Can I get the singers and musicians to come forward? <clears throat> a broken and a contrite spirit, you will not despise. 
See, that's the opposite of arrogance and selfishness. It's the opposite of flesh. Yeah. The Spirit is telling us that self must die. Amen. And God's will is that that we would allow ourselves to die. So whenever we when we when we allow that to happen, it means that our heart is broken before the Lord, and the Lord loves that. The, the Lord is drawn towards that. It says a broken and a contrite spirit, he will not despise. And so from there, my prayer was, Lord, in the flesh, on this earth, we're so worried about ourselves and our own kingdom, but that's not you. Can you, you can just go ahead and, whenever you're ready, if you wouldn't mind, just kind of play softly, because we're going we're gonna to kind of take a little time with this. We're not going to go straight into the song, but if you wouldn't mind strumming the guitar a little bit. My prayer was, Lord, in the flesh, on this earth, we're so worried about ourselves and our own kingdom, but that's not you. You died on this side. So that we could be part of the real kingdom, right? And the more we die to ourselves on this side, the more he's going to be able to use us on this side. And, you know, the Lord's really been putting it on my heart a lot lately to really preach a lot about for us to believe that there really is, there's another kingdom that we're going to enter into. It's real. It's, it's not a fairy tale. The, the millennial reign of Christ is going to come. And the parable of the talents and all the parables of the kingdom are trying to prepare our hearts to understand it's real. And that whatever's done in this life and on this earth is going to affect that. And the Lord just wants you and I to learn to yield to him and to yield to his will. And whatever he's called you to do for him. You know, some people, some people, the Lord make some wealthy, they get finances, but it's not just about money. Sometimes people are, they, they pray. They pray for God's will to be done on the earth. They pray for God's will. Like, I, I met up with an old boy the other day. I mean, he wouldn't mind saying his name, but he's a man that a lot of people know in the community. He's been saved forever, and I happened to see him at one of the clinics, and he was like, brother, you're on my list. Every morning, I got 27 pastors that I start my morning with, and I'm just going through the list praying for him. He said, I thought I was going to be a pastor. I thought I was going to be up there for you. But the Lord showed me, this is my will for your life. And he said, that's how I start every morning, brother. I just want you to know somebody's praying for you every morning. Praise God. That takes a commitment, yeah. right? It takes a commitment for somebody to be willing to pray for somebody that's not even his pastor. 25 other people on that list that are not even his pastor, but yet he's praying for him every morning. See, God's got a plan for you in the kingdom. It may not be to stand behind the pulpit. It might be to go do a little prison ministry every now and then. It might, I don't know what it is, but it's to minister the truth of God and to be a witness on the earth that other people could hear the good news of Jesus Christ. That's Christianity, my friend, or part of it. You know, a lot of the stuff that we've been told that's out there is, is, not, is not, I don't believe it's real Christianity. So I was like, Lord... Help us to die so that we can work with you in your kingdom. Because you know what Jesus said this? He said to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. That's David's heart right there. He, he bows prostrate to God's will. Jesus lowered himself to the Father's will. He said, not my will, but your will be done. So this morning, have we been willing in our life to prostrate ourselves, to bow before God's will? Are we willing to fully give our heart, whatever that means, to the Lord? You know, I felt like the Lord, I felt like the Lord put it on my heart to, to do something a little bit different. And I don't know if this is maybe somebody that's going to watch the video or if it's somebody in here, but look, if you have never truly made a public confession that you need Jesus I want you to know that that's important and, and in order to be saved you have to have faith you have to exhibit faith I'm not going to even ask anybody to come up front but I tell you what I am going to say is this is that if that's you here and you're not sure whether or not you've truly received the Lord as your Savior I want to encourage you to stand up this morning and I'm going to ask somebody that's near you to pray with you. And so listen, if the Lord's speaking to your heart right now, 
Don't don't deny it. Don't don't allow your emotions to make you feel strange or weird or whatever. I want to encourage you that that at any point in time you can stand up, amen. Because because the Bible says this that in order for a person to be saved, they have to believe in their heart and they have to confess with their mouth. It's not just to believe in your head. But it's to believe in your heart and to profess Jesus with your mouth. And all I can tell you is that whenever people do that, something happens. Whenever somebody's willing to stand up and to say, Lord, I want you. Lord, I want to bow my life to your will. God does a mighty work on the inside of our heart and he transforms. And I feel like the Lord wanted me to say, maybe you're watching in, the, in your living room and you're like, and you feel like the Holy Spirit's being you stand up, get out of your recliner, stand up, because we're about to pray. Amen. And somebody's going to stand up. But listen, while we're doing that, I wanted to tell you, I felt like the Lord also, well, nobody stood up yet, but that doesn't mean that you don't have time to stand up before we're done. Amen. Praise God, if you need to. But also, I also felt like the Lord wanted me to encourage people that are seeking after the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And before, and before we get into that, I want to just encourage you to understand something. That the gift of tongues is different than the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in other tongues. In order to operate in gifts appropriately, you have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, some people may disagree with this, but this is the Pentecostal position. That the initial physical evidence that you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that you speak in other tongues. You don't have to be saved. You don't have to speak in tongues to be saved. That's not true. No, it's a it's a second work of grace. But look, speaking in tongues is, is also, I believe, what Jude said when he said, praying in your praying in the spirit, building up your most holy faith. That whenever you have a prayer language, the prayer language is different than the gift of tongues. The gift of tongues is for public exhortation, but it has to have an interpretation with it. That's not what we're talking about when we're talking about your prayer language and praying in tongues. So if that's you this morning and you've been seeking after the Lord and you desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit, I want to get you to stand up because we're going to get somebody to come pray with you. Praise God, sister. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody that has faith Thank you, brother, back there. Somebody that has faith, Jessica, if, or if you're leaving, that's fine, Pam, or a couple of y'all, if you come lay hands on Allie, because we're going to believe the Lord to minister. Aaron, if you could lay hands on our brother back there, praise God. Somebody else, come lay hands on, on Manuel, right? Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. All right, hallelujah. And listen, next is going to be your physical body. We're going to believe God to heal you if you need a healing, amen? So listen. If you're standing up because you need to publicly profess Jesus, right now I'm going to pray with you first. Amen. And if that's you, I want you to pray it and I want you to speak it. Amen. I want you to speak after me. Father, I've sinned against you. I've lived my life the way that I wanted to live my life. And I didn't even know that it was wrong. I didn't even know that it was against your word. Lord, I'm asking you to forgive me. Jesus, I thank you for dying for me. Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose on the third day from the dead. Change my heart, Lord. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Teach me your ways. And I'm just going to pray for you, brother. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for the work. I thank you for his public profession to put faith in you, oh Lord God. And I pray, Lord God, that you seal him like your word says with your Holy Spirit, oh Lord God. That you protect him and build a hedge of protection around him, Lord. That you fill him, Lord, with a hunger. That he fill your presence in a way like never before, oh Lord God. Oh, we give you glory and honor, Lord. I thank you. Hey, let's give a hand clap. Amen. The Bible says that the angels are singing in heaven. The Bible says that the angels are singing in heaven right now. And for, for the rest of you that are standing up right now because you, did, you desire to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I just want to say it. I just want to say a little something to you. Listen, it's about faith. It's about believing. 
okay? And, and, and all I can tell you is this. This is something that I learned. And I believe this with all of Walmart. And I, look, I, used to, I, was, I, I don't mean to go on and on about it, but I want you to understand something. I used to go up to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit every week at Sister Toast Church. And I told y'all this story. One time she literally took my bottom jaw and she told me to speak it out. Okay? And look, I questioned. I questioned whenever I would speak in tongues whether it was even real or not. I can tell you one thing. I went through probably a six to seven year period where I didn't even speak in tongues. I was bound up in sin. But I'm here to tell you that there was one day after my sister died that I was in my car. And all of a sudden, there it was. I heard it again, and it started bubbling out of me. And there wasn't nobody ever going to tell me that that wasn't real. And so what I'm here to tell you this, this morning is this. Is that you're, you, you can't speak English at the same time you speak in tongues. The Bible says that the Spirit will give you the utterance. But you have to speak it. And sometimes what you hear is just, I don't know how to tell you. It's like you hear it in your spirit. It's the same way when the Holy Spirit speaks to you. And sometimes it sounds like it's one syllable. Maybe sometimes it sounds like it's a, it, it, it's a two to three syllables. I don't know what it's going to sound like to you. But what I'm trying to tell you is this, is that when you hear it in your spirit, you've got to speak it. And if you don't speak it, you got to have faith to speak it. Amen. Jeremy, can you come lay hands on Brother Joe or John? Can you lay hands on him? So look, I'm going to ask them to start singing here in a second. And whenever they do, you lift your hands to heaven. Lift your hands to heaven because you're worshiping the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And whenever you begin to worship the Lord and you begin to cry out to God, I'm here to tell you that you got to speak it. You're going to hear it. you got to speak it. Amen. Lift your hands to heaven. Let's worship the King.